Welcome to the Strong Single and Human podcast, a real look at single parenting, how to navigate the ups and downs of life with kids on your own while keeping sane. We cover all manner of subjects from domestic violence, dealing with childhood trauma, through to fussy eaters and how to help your kids become resilient. I'm your host, Claire Martin. Welcome. This week's guest, Nikki Bilu, was a single father with two sons and has his own business. He is a top thought leader in the area of entrepreneurship, branding and sales and has been called the Napoleon Hill of the 21st century, interviewing over 300 of the world's top thought leaders like Jack Canfield, John Maxwell and many more. Not only has he made over a thousand media appearances, he has also written and published eight books, several of which are number one international bestsellers, and he has read over 4,000 books in his lifetime. And if that all wasn't enough, he has a business that generates six figures a month and has helped over 70 entrepreneurs adding six to eight figures a year to their income. Now he would love to come on our podcast and share his insights into parenting and running a successful business. This is the Strong, Single and Human podcast. Hi, welcome, Nikki. Welcome to the podcast. Claire, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. No, thanks for coming and joining us. Thank you. So look, tell us a little bit about your journey and and how you've got to come here and talk to me today. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I'm originally actually uh, an immigrant to Canada from the Middle East. I'm a Christian from Iran. When I was 11 years old, my oh, um, okay. my family was living in Tehran and the Islamic Revolution took place, you know, a portentous world changing event. And <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, my late father, God rest his soul, he could see the writing on the wall that this was not going to be a great place for him to raise his Christian family anymore. So he made a plan, and he eventually got us out of Iran and settled us into Toronto, Ontario, Canada, where I now live. Wow. And, you know, I thank God every day for my dad's foresight. You know, at the time, it was horrible to leave my home, and I hated it. But looking back, God, that man changed our family's trajectory and legacy. You know, because well, it could have been so much different, couldn't it? As well, yeah. And yeah. you know, Dad passed away just under three years ago, and um, but that man, his his impact on my life echoes through time, and it was the thing that um, made me so grateful for living in the West. You know, there's a lot of people who live in the West that don't understand how good we have it here. I know. Right? Like It's funny you say that. I've just sat here and written three things that I'm grateful for this morning because that's what I do each morning is remind myself how lucky I am. Yeah. You know. And there's so many people in the West that don't get it. And there's, especially these people, unfortunately, some of them are in government that just go, well, you know, Canada, America, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, France, the West, very oppressive, very racist, very sexist. And I'm not trying to pretend everything's perfect, okay? Because it's not. But are you kidding me? Are you out of your freaking mind? This is the greatest, greatest set of societies on the planet. People have it better here than anywhere else. You want oppression? Come to Iran with me. Open your mouth, and I'll I'll watch while they drag you away, beat you to death, throw you in a prison until you die, and no one ever comes to see you. Because that's what they do to people there in the rest of the world, right? We need to be grateful for what we have, and I think all of us need to stand up against these nut bars that are trying to tell us this place sucks. Because, yeah, come on, let's be real. Yeah. Right? This is great. I know. Wow. Yeah. 
Okay, so you came across at, at 11, was it you said? 11? 11 is the when the revolution happened. We left when I was 13. Oh. It took a while to make it happen, right? Wow, but yeah, it wasn't. Wow. Yeah. And it took us another two years to get finally to Canada. So it was a four-year process oh my be God. between when all this went down and when we finally arrived in the West. So you were, it was quite a, an integral time in your life, really, because you were becoming a teenager, really, um, when you had this massive upheaval. Yes. So how did that affect you? Wow, what an amazing question. Well, first and foremost, I did not want to leave. I was a kid. I, wow. You know, this was my home. home. These were my friends. We were being uprooted. It was like they kept telling us, look, we'll come back. But that really wasn't going to happen. We knew that. We didn't know that at the time. But in retrospect, my parents probably understood that we were not, not, not going, to, going to be coming back home. And by the time that became clear to me, I was deeply saddened, like horribly, deeply, deeply saddened. You know what I'm trying to say here? It was not a fun time in my life. It was it was a horrible time in my life, actually, Claire. Um, I would cry myself to sleep for the first uh, few months, like every single night. Like I, I hated it, but it was understandable. I mean, you think about it, a little child you know, 12, 13 years old, coming to a new country, doesn't speak the language. We went to Greece at first. We didn't speak any Greek, you know, and um, the Greeks were nice to us, but it, it was, it was horrible for me. Well, and it's also like you're because used to, about. you're used to your culture yeah. as well, aren't you, right? So, and every country has a different culture, right? And there are cultures within cultures, right? So you're used to your culture in Iran, and then you go to Greece, different culture completely, don't speak the language. Um, and then although people were nice to you, which sometimes doesn't happen to immigrants, right? Um, it's still, you're still getting used to a different way of life, different food, different everything really so it's a massive upheaval and then you move and then two years later you move to Canada you probably just got used to it and then you move to Canada which was completely different and that is two cultures French and English cultures as such so yeah and you moved to Toronto though so Toronto's not as uh, for want of a better word Frenchified as Montreal and places like that yeah. But even so, you've still got those elements. So when we came, we came here in 1982, right? 78 is when the revolution started to happen, right? Uh, it's September, seven, August, September 78. By the time we got to Canada, it was July 1982. And at that time, you know, Canada was, had just recently started opening itself up to immigrants from all over the world. There have been lots of immigrants that had come to Canada from places like Italy and Portugal and Greece, but there were hardly any Iranians in Toronto. Like we were one of the few. Now, over a period of time, that changed. And right now there's a couple hundred thousand Iranians in Toronto. But back then, zero. Zero. Like, I don't want to say zero, but. But maybe a handful. Community. Handful, yeah. yeah. And, you know, Canada for me was scary at first scary yeah. i didn't want to be here either like we left greece and i'm like okay we just got used to greece now we've left and we're in this place and we, we we lived in a place and we went to school in a place that was dark we moved to a better place after a year but our school it was it was like inner city almost you know wow. there were people from all kinds of uh nationalities they're like, it was a little United Nations, but it was like tough school. There were some nasty kids there, you know. Um, but I, su I suppose you've got all these kids that are trying to deal with the situations that they're in, which brings out either the best or the worst in people. And um, you yeah. just got to deal with it. So, so how did this all affect you as the person now and, and where you are now and what you do now? Well, you know, after a period of time, a number of years, right, um, 
I started to assimilate. I mean, by by 1985, I entered university, right? So I was in school three years into Canada. I was in university in 85. And I, I was starting to become Canadianized in many ways. I still had many Iranian um, characteristics, but I, I'd started to become Canadianized. And I and I was I was in university. I was studying year one and year two. My 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 uh, my marks were okay, but in year three I stepped it up and my marks just shot up. You know, and I went from like a, a low B to a to an A. Which was awesome, wow. yeah, right. Um, and um, so, what happened to you to go and do this extreme? Like, well, it's not extreme, but like to jump. Did it? What did something like trigger in your brain to go? Yep, here we go. Um, I've been just cruising, but now I really, I'm going to hit the heights. Well, a few things happened. I've always been a reader. I've read over 4,000 books in my lifetime, okay? Wow, yeah. Um, so I'm a serious reader. But um, here's what uh, here's what happened as far as uh, I'm concerned. Um, I started to be introduced to the works of a particular author. Her name is Ayn Rand. You okay. familiar with her books? No. She, so she wrote her two most famous books are called The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, and they're novels. She's written nonfiction, but those novels were written in the 40s and the 50s. And she was a Russian uh, refusenik, an immigrant, like a Jewish Russian person who came to the United States to escape communism. And the books she wrote, these were books that were all about the individual and the the glory of the individual. And I read uh I read Atlas Shrugged while I was working on a university paper. And it just spoke to my soul. And this is an eleven hundred plus page novel. This is a weighty tome. I read it in a week. And I read it in a week while I was writing a paper, a major paper for a course. And on top of that, I did not sleep. I slept an hour a night for a week while oh I read God. this book and wrote the paper. And it woke me up. And I was just excited about the message. And I became a champion of freedom in that moment because of Ayn Rand, because of my father, you know, who he was and how he was. All of that led up to me reading this book. That spoke wow. to my soul. Well, well, it makes me want to get this book now. <laughs> I've never, no, I've never, I've, and maybe it's a country thing, right? But I've never, I've never heard of her. But that's awesome. Okay, and then A Y N R A N D. Okay. Ayn Rand. I'll see if it's and is it still in print. Are... Oh God, yeah, she sells. You you can go on Amazon and they'll they'll deliver it for you in two days. I would recommend you buy all her novels, but The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged are the best. Now she wrote some nonfiction books, and they're good, but they're a little strident. The novels, the novels are oh boring. really? How good? They are. Okay, I'm. Yeah. I, they're going on my list. They're going on my list because that's one of the questions I ask. But yeah, no. Okay, so you read this book. And it just switched something on in you. It resonated with you and you were like, okay, this is it. So then you did university, left university, all good. Yeah, I, so I finished year three and year four. And then I, I applied to go do my master's. And I did my master's in um, a university in the United States called Georgetown University. It's in Washington, D.C. It is one of their so-called Ivy League schools. You know, those those schools that are, uh, you know, uh, older, traditional, and uh, highly regarded, prestigious. So I went to Georgia. We have them in the UK, and I'm sure they're here in Australia, but I haven't got to that yeah, stage yeah. with my son. Yeah, like Oxford go. and Cambridge it, it, in the it's, UK. It's, and it's things along like those yeah, lines, there we go. the Oxfords and the Cambridges, you know. So um, Georgetown is a school that was created and run by Jesuits for many years. and. Uh, 
it, it was an incredible experience. But believe it or not, I was actually really well prepared to crush it at Georgetown because the courses that I took there were easier, less challenging academically than the courses I'd taken at the University of Toronto. Now, I had some incredible teachers and I learned some cool things, but I had been trained on how to prepare, how to write papers, how to take tests, and boom, I actually did an almost an A-plus average there, 3.85 out of 4 GPA. Wow. And so I crushed it in school, but when I left school, I was lost because a recession happened in 1991 when I finished my, my, my program there. And I just, I, I had these, these, um, these almost fantasies of what I was going to do. And these fantasies didn't come alive because there were no jobs available for folks like me. I would go and I would, I would, um, I would sit down and I would uh, try to get a job at, at a Wall Street firm at a at a uh, you know at a big marketing company, and those people took one look at me and said, "No, this is not our guy." And thank God for that because at the time I was so upset and disappointed. But I'm not a corporate guy. I'm not somebody who was meant to be in those lines. Now I ended up getting a corporate job two years later, uh, but that just showed me I shouldn't have been there. I was there for four and a half years. And I knew that I needed bigger and better things. I wanted to do marketing. I thought that would be cool, but I didn't really get an opportunity to have a marketing job. I, I got into sales, which I didn't really want. I wanted to do marketing, but sales taught me the things I needed to know. It was like God was giving me all the things in the moment that I hated, but all the lessons I needed to learn, <laughs> you know? I know. It's weird how it all happens like that. I agree with you. You know, it, you're sort of being directed. You want to go in one direction and people go, nah, that's not for you. You need to be doing this. You need to keep going and doing X, Y, and Z, um, even though you don't yeah. want to. Yeah, yeah. I know. So, I know. Uh, you know, so I, I'm I'm out of corporate uh, about eight and a half years into, in, in, uh, into my corporate life. Sorry, four and a half years into my corporate life. I take a brief a hiatus, uh, actually five years, and I go to the Middle East. Not brief. Um, yeah. <laughs> yep. Like I, it was two months uh, of a hiatus that I took. I went to the Middle East to Dubai in 98. I thought this was going to be great. My dad was involved with a fellow over there. I was supposed to be working with him. The fella didn't want me there. And I didn't realize that till I got there. And so within a couple months, I just said, yeah, this is not for me. I don't want to be here. I don't like the guy. He doesn't like me. I'm out of here. So I left. I came back to Canada. It took me a few months, but I went back into uh, the world of sales in te the telecommunication space, which I'd been in. And, um, and then from that, I got into an internet company wow. and I was a salesman in the internet company. And I made the biggest sale of my career. I made a half a million dollar sale. Wow. Like, that was a big deal. It was in, um, it was in uh, 1999, December 1999 was the genesis. By early 2000, the sale was made. And then I didn't want to be there anymore. And I left. I took another job, bigger paying sales job with another internet company. And I was high flying. I got promoted. I became a director of sales, making more money than I'd ever made before. And 2001 hits along, the dot com crash comes, boom, company goes bankrupt. Oh my God. Left owing so, me a lot of money. No so, job, and you were owed money. I was owed a ton of money. And um, I was trying to figure out well, what am I going to do? But, you know, there were no jobs. There were no jobs. I, I went on interviews, no jobs. Well, especially for what you were doing because dot com yeah. had crashed. So the first internet company I was with, they remembered me and they, the original founder bought it back for a song. And so, um, he hired me on for, uh, a period of time on a consulting contract, but I didn't want to be there. And I made some sales, but I said, yeah, I went out and I deliberately didn't hit the number. Like I came close, but I didn't hit the number. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go figure this out. And I was on a path of self-discovery. So I was doing a lot of programs and reading. So I've always been a person who's done a lot of personal developments. 
I, I did the Silver Method program in the late 80s. I did a lot more of their work into the 90s. I did NLP, NLP Master Practitioner, Practitioner. And then I did the Landmark work, Landmark Forum, Landmark Advanced Course. These were all the things that I was doing. And um, here's what happened. Okay. Uh, and this this might this might blow you away a little bit. But um, I was thinking of doing a program, and one of the people that was there really stood for me um, to do this program, this landmark program. And it all just kind of came together at the last minute, and I ended up, I had no money. I was broke, but I had points. And with points, I was able to get a flight to Philadelphia. And the the course was being taught in two different cities. I couldn't get uh, the point that the airline didn't have tickets on points to the other city, but they had them to Philadelphia. So I go to Philadelphia. And while I'm there, I meet this woman from Toronto who ended up becoming my wife five months later. <laughs> wow. Crazy story, right? So we, we met, we had a whirlwind romance. We fell in love. We got married and uh, I was lost still. I was lost and lost and lost. I was trying to figure out what was next. She had a, a, a pretty good job, so we were okay, but I was embarrassed. I mean, I'm a grown-ass man, and my woman's taking care of me, so I didn't want that. Um, you know. Well, but, it's about being a partnership, isn't it, at the end of the day? So it's about... Yeah, but, you know, as a... As, both of you contributing. Yeah, but, you know, come on, as a man, like, to not be not be contributing anything to, like... Yeah, it, it was not... It did not feel good. No. no, it's not who you are. No. So, but then I, I, I kind of stumbled into like becoming a coach of sorts. And I got into fitness coaching because I was very fit at the time. And I started to coach people. And then I got introduced to two Olympic champions, track and field, gold medalist. Started to work with them. We put a fitness program together. And I started to coach people in how to train and have the mindset of gold medal athletes because i worked with these guys and it worked really well i got a whole bunch of clients i became known as the ceo health coach and i spoke to all these ceo groups and then my then wife kind of a few years into this just decided she didn't want to be married to me my youngest son had been sick he was in the hospital it was tough on both of us, and I did not know how to deal with her. And she was very scared, and my job was to put my arm around her and say, I love you, honey, we'll deal with this together, but I didn't do that. I got her fear made me angry because it brought my own fear up, and anyways, up the marriage up. And It's like a reminder. It was terrible. And I went through hell. Uh, you know, my business collapsed. My business had been doing well. It collapsed. I was sleeping on my mother's couch. You know, um, I was out of the house for over a year. And then slowly but surely, I started to do work. I hired coaches. I worked with folks. And um, I started to make some more money. Not a lot, but some more. And um, then uh, I met the woman that I'm with now. And we've been together just shy of 12 years now, me and this other woman. And, wow. you know, while I'm going through this process, I'm trying to um, get divorced and build a business and figure out who I want to be going forward in life. What I realized was I don't want to be a fitness trainer. It was good to be working with those Olympic gold medalists, but with them not in the picture, just to train people. I felt that a lot more to offer the world and it wasn't, it wasn't feeling good that I was not given my full gifts. So, um, I go to a talk. There's a man there who delivered the talk and it resonated powerfully. What was the talk? And what was the talk? The talk Don't leave us a, hanging. Come the, on, Nikki. The talk was, the talk was called, how to sell a lobster. What? Right. How to sell a lobster? Yeah. It's, it's, so 
I'll tell you his story. So he comes on stage and he said he worked at a restaurant in Canada when he was a, uh, you know, in university. And um, this restaurant had a, a desire to have people sell lobsters, their wait staff to sell lobsters. And um, there was a contest. Cooked ones or live ones? Well, you cook them while they're alive. Well, I, so they're like, so, okay, well, I get you. So there's a restaurant, a restaurant. you point out your live yeah. lobster and then so, it gets put so in a pot. Funny, you know, there's a contest and um, most people didn't sell a lot of lobsters. One fella sold 90, but this fellow who told the story sold 1,500 in a month. What? And That's a hell of a lot of lobster. Yeah. So um, what he did was he... He delivered his message to the diners in such a way that they bought. Everybody else said, um, would you like to buy a lobster after someone ordered whatever they ordered, right? So I had to add a lobster to that. That was how they did it. But he would come in and he'd say, can I tell you about our specials? Everybody loves specials, right? And he said, our special is surf and turf steak and a lobster and the price is really special and he gave the price which was actually the regular price but the way he framed it, it made it sound like this was an amazing deal and you should take the and everybody's i want the special right i want the special while the people that were saying would you like to buy a lobster after people had said they want yeah. to buy a steak they're like oh ah, and so he he extracted some lessons from that and shared them with us and when the talk was over, I walked up to him and I introduced myself and I, I told him my story and I just said, hey, um, I think I'd like to hire you. And he was there to get clients potentially, right? To do a talk and get people to come to him. So, yeah. Um, so here's what happened. He and I were speaking. And I said, I'd like to hire you. And he looks at me and he goes, okay, yeah, we can meet. But he says, I do need to tell you something. Um, and I said, what? He said, you know, I, and he talked about it during the session. He said, my minimum fee, minimum program I do is $5,000, right? And I go, okay, $5,000, right, right, right. Yeah. And he said, and that's for five hours of my time as your coach. I offer no guarantees, no refunds, and I expect payment in full in advance. And I'm like, damn. And I'm like, um, I don't have that money. I, I, I think I'd made $5,000 the last year. Like, that's how bad it was. Wow. Um, so, anyways, he um, he looks at me and he goes, okay. He said, I, I want to give you some free coaching, kid. He's maybe 10 years older than me, but I was a kid to him, right? I was a kid. It was great. Um, so I said, okay, give it to me. And he said, he said to me, all right, it doesn't matter that you don't have $5,000. And it does. But and I said, okay. But you just told me without $5,000, I can't work with you. So I don't understand. I thought it matters very much, right? And he said, well, no, it doesn't. He said, here's all that matters. How bad do you want change? Okay. And I'm like, he looks at me, he goes, you just told me that your wife kicked you out of the house. You're sleeping on your mother's couch. You don't get to see your kids and you're broke and you need to turn this around. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he said, he said to me, how bad do you want to change this? I just looked at him. I go, oh, God, really badly. He said, if you are telling me the truth, then you will find a way to come up with $5,000 and pay me and we'll get this done. And if you don't want to change that badly, you won't. And he said, either way, I'm good. Well, yeah, I suppose it's no skin off his nose yeah. and such. No, it really isn't. He says, either way, I'm good. You hire me great. You don't hire me great. But you, are you good? 
if you don't get my help to turn this around. Wow. Okay. So what did you do? And I'm like, so Claire, like, I wanted to punch him in the mouth is what I wanted to do, right? Right? Like, I mean, he basically just attacked me and my manhood and my, and my, and, and, and just stripped me bare. Like I was naked there, emotionally speaking, but he was right. He was 1000% right. And let me tell you something. I coach people, right? I'm really freaking good at it. My job as a coach, my number one job is to get you to see the freaking truth and stop bullshitting yourself. Right? Because we all, all day long, are bullshitting ourselves and telling ourselves crappy things that are not true and are keeping us stuck. That is the facts of life. Yeah, it is. You want to lose that 20K? You want to lose that 20K? And you'd say, oh, yeah, I want to lose it. It's... I really want to change, but you're still drinking the wine, shoving the chocolate in or whatever. You know, you want to earn extra money, but you're not willing to put in the extra time. That's fair enough. You want a better relationship with your kids. Well, you need to put the extra time in. You need to give something, you don't you? You give it all. And um, I looked at him and I said, okay, can you give me a couple of days? A couple of days. And here's what I did. I well, fair enough. A couple of days, yeah. I made an appointment well, to go enough. see him in his office. See, at the time, I I I was still a, a fitness trainer, right? I'd not made the transition into into business coaching. So, I had been in conversation with a couple of folks about training them, and they had not made up their mind. They had not said yes. They had not said no. So I was like full of fire and intensity and piss and vinegar. And I just, I texted and called these guys. I said, we're going to talk right now, right now, right now, right now. And they're like, okay, okay, okay. And I said, okay, I've got great news for you. And they go, okay. I said, look, here's the facts. You need to lose weight. You're fat. And I go, yeah, yeah, right? Is this the truth? And he said, and I, I'm broke and I need money, right? I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to help you lose that weight. And I'm going to give you the deal of a century. You're going to get half price from the last price we talked about. But there's a catch. What's the catch? You have to say yes now and you have to pay me now. What's it going to be? It's either yes now or it's no forever. What's it going to be? You're going to stay fat or you're going to get, get fit. He's like, okay, fine. Here's the money. So I did this with two guys and they both said yes. Right? And obviously, I had stripped them bare the way he'd stripped me bare, right? <laughs> like, and they they too were like, "Okay, fuck, I got to do something about this. I don't want to stay fat anymore, right? Like, I'm that's not gonna that's not what I want." And so I had two thousand dollars of the five, and I was excited. So I, I I I took the money, you know, it was in the form of like checks or whatever, and I, I come up to him and I go, "Here we go." I was all like, "I'm like, yeah, I'm so excited!" and he looks at me and he looks at the checks and he goes, that's great. But I said, five, not two. <laughs> and, you know, this was the moment of truth, right? The moment of truth. So I just looked at him and I just said, okay. I said, listen, Bill, his name was Bill. Bill, over your career, over the course of your career, how many times have you told this story given this speech to people that you gave to me a couple days ago and he's like oh okay well you know probably 30 40 times over the years i'm like okay 30 40 times that's a lot right yeah and here's my next question bill besides me who else came back to you with any money and he said oh you're the first I'm the first. I said, Bill, then take my damn money, Bill, and I'll sign a contract and I'll pay the rest off within 30 days, 60 days, whatever. I, I forget exactly. Whatever the case may be, right? Um, And he agreed. Like, you know what I mean? Because I had been the only person who had come back with any money, he kind of figured, what have I got to lose? 
I'll do the first two hours with this guy. If he doesn't have the money by then, screw it. I'm not going to do the rest with him, right? So, well, so, and, and yeah. also that you just proved that you had the passion and you had the drive to want to change that. Like, right. instead of somebody who actually had the money, who was just like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll pay this money and go and do the course. You were like, I really need to do this. And you went and got almost half the money. So what happened as a result of me doing that um, was very straightforward, very simple. I made $100,000 in the next six months. Which is better than five over the last year. <laughs> exactly. And the rest is history. But here is what I learned from this experience. I mean, I learned what he taught me about how to go and get clients and all that jazz. But what I learned from this experience was I learned that I and anybody who wants to be successful has to do four things, has to embody four qualities. Number one is I got to make a decision. I got to be decisive that I am here to change my life, my business, my relationship, my health, my weight, whatever, right? But the decision has to be irrevocable because what is decide? Deciding it comes from the root of it is a Latin word, side which means to kill off. To decide is to kill off the alternative. So I have to kill off the alternative to achieving this result. So in my case, kill off the alternative to making money, kill off the alternative to success. The decision comes first. Then I must commit to do what it takes. I cannot be a tire kicker or a dabbler, or a hobbyist. Let me pick the tire. The commitment has to be there, and i got to take the action. So how do you, how do you get yourself to commit? Because that, for me, I look at that and I go, well, that's pretty hard, because you can decide to I'll lose get weight. To I'll okay. get to all of that. All right, I'll get cool. to all of that. So it is, a, it is a mindset game first. The first thing has to be, you've got to understand when you commit that you are going to suck for a while at what you are committing to. You must look yourself in the eye and go, I suck at this. Not like I'm a bad person, oh, it's so horrible, but I suck. I just suck. I suck. But the good news is, the good news is that I will not suck forever and that tomorrow I will be a little bit better. And the next day, and as long as I keep with my commitment, there will be a time where I will no longer suck. There will be a time where I'll go from suck to mediocre. Like, I'll just look in the mirror and go, I'm now mediocre. I don't suck anymore. Progress. And there'll be a time where I'll go from mediocre to being decent, average, right? I'll be average. And then there'll be a time where I'll go from average to Good. I'll be good. I'll, I'll actually be good. And then there'll be a time where I'll go from good to masterful. Masterful. You with me? Masterful. You've got to understand that every master was once a disaster. And everybody should write that down. Every master was once a disaster. You must be willing to be a disaster if you're ever going to be a master. You follow me? It is an emotional decision. You cannot expect that just because you decided you're going to be awesome right now. No, it's the suck. And proudly say, I suck, I suck, I suck, but I'm still going. I'm working. I'm getting better. I'm doing this. I'll suck less tomorrow. Yeah. That's yeah. And, and also okay. in that journey. Now, here's the third thing. You but in do. that journey, you're also going to have bad days, right? So don't let a bad day or a bad week throw you back again or a thousand bad wow. days i was hoping it wasn't no, going to no, be a you, thousand you gotta, listen it could be you got to be prepared that it could be you could totally have a thousand bad days before you have your first good day and you can't look at it as oh my god it's a thousand days no every day 
you're going to look at this because day one, well, you'll suck. Day two, you'll suck. The first 30 days, you're going to feel like you suck, even though you're getting better. You're going to feel like I suck. When I got into what this fellow wanted me to do, the first 20 days, I was brutal. Brutal. I don't mean bad. I mean brutal. Day 21, I was just bad. Okay. And I noticed it. I'm like, I'm not brutal anymore. But how did you stay committed, right? right, right. Because you were bad for 20 days. How did you not give up? You have to understand the decision, the decision had been made. There was no going back. The alternative was killed. Okay. There's no going back. The alternative is killed. Okay. It's dead. So you got kill it in your brain. You go, well, there is no, there is only forward. You are like the, you are like the, the Greeks going to Troy to get Helen back and you're Agamemnon and you burnt the freaking ships. So you tell your soldiers, we cannot retreat. We get Helen or we die. Which, what do you choose? You choosing death or you choosing we're doing this. And that's, that is the that is decision that's killing off the alternatives. You cannot, that's what I'm talking about. No hobbyist, no, I'll try it. No, 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 no. Losers think like that. Winners don't. And then thirdly, you must be someone who is coachable. You must have mentors and coaches. You have to have them. You will not get this done on your own. Because why? Because you suck. And people who suck cannot do it on their own. They need mentors and coaches. People who are masterful are the mentors and coaches, but you are not yet masterful. You suck. You must be humble enough to go in the mirror and go, I suck. It's okay. I'm a good person, but I suck at this. I'm a, I, am, I am kind. I am great. I am lovable. I am loyal. I, I, I am with my family and friends. I, I, there are so many things about me that don't suck, but this, I suck. <laughs> great at everything but I am determined to become great at this. And I will get a coach who does not suck to show me how not to suck. And I will be coachable. I will do what they say. You with me? That is coachability. And then the fourth thing we already talked about, you've got to be resourceful. It is not how much money or time or energy you think you have. It is how bad do you want change and how resourceful are you to get what you need to achieve change. That is what I learned from this experience. And if somebody is listening to this and you're hurting in some way, maybe you need to lose the weight. Maybe you need to fix your relationship or maybe you need to get over your relationship. Maybe you need to make more money. I don't know what your, whatever the itch is for you. Are you willing to make a decision and leave no other alternative to that decision. Are you willing to commit and be okay to suck for a while before you don't suck? Are you willing to be coached by a coach who knows what they're doing? And are you willing to be resourceful enough to figure out whatever you need to figure out, money, time, energy, what have you, to get this done? If the answer is yes to all four, success is assured. If the answer is not yes to any of them, and by yes, I could mean maybe I'll see to no, you're done. Yeah. Don't even start. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Because at the end of the day, right, if you look at, and we, I'll take the example of losing weight, right, if you go, oh, I don't have the time because, you know, I've got a, I'm a single mom or I'm a single dad and I've got to work and, you know, so I've got to get my kids up in the morning. I've got to work. I've got to do X, Y, and Z. Then when I come home, I've got to feed them, get them to bed, et cetera, et cetera. I look at it and go, get up earlier. There's always a solution to a problem. You just got to figure out what that is, right? So if that means go to bed with your kid, you know, when you put your child to bed, but get up earlier so that you can work out, you can do whatever, get healthier food in the house. What, you know, just make little changes, but you've got to, like you say, you've got to make, want to make that change because there are a myriad of different bloody excuses you could use. Um, and do you find that people use that, like people go to those excuses straight away? Listen. You need to understand that I am not a person that invites excuses. Well, that's when fair people, enough. <laughs> when people come to me, they know I'm not going to listen to their excuses. They just know. I'm like, I, I'm like, listen, 
if you came to have somebody say, oh, that's okay, you're so good, you're so brave, came the wrong person. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair enough. Coming to me, because I'm daddy. I'm father energy. You know, everyone needs mother energy, the love and the nurturing and the caring. Everybody does, but that's not what I do, <laughs> right? I kick your butt and I get you going. So, you know, um, I have a, two teenage sons, right? And um, my ex-wife and I caught one of them doing things that we didn't want him to be doing. And as a result, his, uh, his marks um, suffered in school as well. You know, going out with friends, partying, blah, blah, blah. Being a teenager. Telling us he was on top of schoolwork and he didn't do it. Um, and I told him, I said to him, son, if you do this, this, or this, these will be the consequences. I still love you, but these will be the consequences. And he did this, this, and this. And the consequences were, I took his phone away, I grounded him, and he comes right home after school, doesn't get to go out with his friends right now, and he studies. And I want to see that reflected in his next set of credit card, um, 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 uh, report cards. So, yeah, so if the marks go up to a certain level, um, we're going to give him his phone back now because it's actually kind of getting in our way, not being able to communicate with him. But um, he is still not going out with his friends until those marks are where we need him to be. And if you're a parent, a mother, a father listening to this, and you're soft on your kids, especially a father, what's wrong with you? <laughs> your job is not to be your child's friend. No. Your job is to be your child's father. Yeah, parent first. And father energy. Your kid, your kid should love you, but should be slightly scared of you. Slightly scared of you as a father. They should. They and should as go, a mom. If I screw up too much. Yeah, come on. I, I mean, well, not. well, you know, like I have to say. My son's a little scared of me. He's not scared of his, yeah. of his mom. He's just no, well, not. Mine's scared of She's me, but woman. they think this because there's only She's me. She's the CEO of a company. There you go. She's a CEO of a company. Wow. Okay. So I'm telling you, this is not a, a weak woman. Yeah. Right? She runs. Uh, she's a, she's, you know, she's a go-getter woman. But my son isn't scared of her, but she's scared. Of, he's scared of me. He's scared of me. Oh yeah. There are times when I'm like, you know, and he's in the stage where he's basically saying F you dad. <laughs> right. I'm and establishing my own independent identity and I'm all, I'm all good with that. But here's what I told him. I said, you live under my my uh, my roof, and I'm paying for you, right? So you want my roof, my rules, my roof, my rules, and that's it. And you you start making your own money. No problem, you can make your own rules. But right now, you're not making your own money. <laughs> so you know, I'm having that conversation with a seven year old at the moment. So that's all good because he's going. No, I don't want to do that. And I'm like, well, sorry, buddy. Yeah, it's my house. <laughs> it's my house, my rules. And exactly what you said, when you go and earn your own money, you can do whatever you bloody hell that's, you want. That's how it is. Yeah. That's how it is. That's yeah, how it no, is. I agreed. And, and, but I'll tell you this, right? Like people, look, if you are coming into life and you're accepting excuses from yourself, you're not going to get to live the kind of life you ought to live. So how do you push if you're okay with that? But how do you okay. how do you push through tough times, right? Because you've had a load, right? Like you've been earning big bucks and then you lost it because you lost your job and the dot com and all. How do you drive yourself through those tough times? Because there's a single and you were a single dad, right? As well, because you went through the separation from your your ex wife. And how do you then how do you deal with not having the money that you had a divorce, um, not seeing your sons as you would like, and but still being on top of things? How do you get through that? Because so many people would have gone ah. Oh, drunk you know got drunk or like just and and you know i'm not saying that that's that's not a good thing long term but you know sometimes you'll have to let off steam and stuff but 
even so, how do you how do you get through tough times? How do you push yourself forward, drive? Well, one forward? is the desire has to come from me, and two is I I seek help. I seek mentors, coaches, groups to be a part of because I can't do it alone. Like right now, um, I'm looking to make a transition in my business to the next level, right? And I just realized that I run a number of groups. I coach a number of people. And I have some coaches that I work with. But, you know, I need to be a part of something. And I need to take instruction. And I need to take inspiration. And, uh, yeah. And grow. So I'm looking at, there. there's a particular group um, that, uh, runs a program here in um, North America. It's over Zoom, but I'm thinking I'm going to do it. I think I'm thinking I'm going to sign up for it. I'm thinking I'm going to do the program. I, I think it would be an excellent idea for me to do that. Um, it's 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 one of those things where I'm going to talk to my uh, to my lovely better half. I'm going to say, look, I'm going to do this, and away we go. And I think everybody needs that. You can't do life alone. We're social creatures. Life is about people. We need help. We need to give help. We need to receive help. And and I agree with you. I must admit, when I first came on this single parent journey, it was about finding groups that could help me, right, mentally as well as physically with my child's care, but like finding groups that could help me mentally, going on YouTube and searching positive framing stuff videos on youtube that when i was on a having a shitty day or whatever that i could basically um watch a positive uplifting video that actually made me feel as though i could get through this so yeah look i agree with you it's putting yourself into that positive frame so look nikki where can people like if people want to find out what who you are what you're doing um more than we've just discussed on this podcast, right? And want to speak to you or um, talk to you about coaching, whatever. How do they get in touch with you? How, where could, where do they find you? Asking that question. So um, I've got a number of websites. So uh, there's a website I have called SovereignMan.ca, and that is for the work I do with men. So we have a, a men's community, a men's program that we run there with a the curriculum in it to help men be, you know, more masculine and uh, more powerful as men out in the world. So that that's that, and there's a podcast associated with that. So sovereignman.ca. But if you're a business owner, okay, man or woman, and you are interested in um, going to the next level in business, my I have two business websites. One of them's called ecircleacademy.com, and the other one's called finishlinethinking.com. You can go to either one of those, check out a bunch of, you know, free resources and whatnot. On eCircleAcademy.com, there's my calendar link to jump on a call. And I do something I call a success coaching call. I offer a, a, an initial call for free that helps you get clear on how you're thinking, how your business is going. Let's get you going in such a way that... um You've got a blueprint to get to the next level of success. So all you got to do is go over to that website, yeah. click on that link, and uh, book a call, and away we go. Awesome. Sounds great. Sounds great. Now, my last question, my final question to you, thank you so much for coming on board because I know you're busy um, and telling us all about, like, um, what you're doing and how what your journey's been like and how we need to – start to instigate change within our lives and how we can do it. Um, look, a last question. I think I know your answer to that question, but I'm fine. Uh, if you could recommend a book to my listeners, what would it be? Well, the book that we talked about at the beginning of the show. I know. I thought you'd say yeah, that. Is Ayn Rand in her book, The, the Fountainhead, in her book, her other book, Atlas Shrugged. Everybody should read that. I mean, I'm an author myself. If you go on Amazon and you you know type in my name, Nikki Baloo, there's a bunch of books I've got. If you're interested in reading my musings, I would be very happy that you would. So definitely go do that. But those two books are are actually absolutely amazing. Wow. Okay. Cool. Look, thank you. 
Thank you for the book recommendation. That's awesome. And thank you for coming on the podcast. It's great talking to you. You've got so much enthusiasm. Like it's seven in the morning here and I was knackered when I came on here. And now I'm like, right, okay, I need to get my lists going and start organising what goals I've got this year. So, um, yeah, look, thank you for that, Nikki. And, um, yeah, we'll say have a great day. I shall. Can I um, say one last thing before we go? Yeah, of course. I love to read. I read a lot of books. And um, I recently started doing these uh, short book reviews. They're exclusively on Rumble. Rumble is a free speech alternative to YouTube, R-U-M-B-L-E. And they're under my, my, my kind of overall channel over there is called Persian Poet, because I'm Persian and I'm a poet. So if you go there, you'll see all my videos, all the podcast videos. But there are a number of um, videos there that are book reviews. They're four to five minutes long. And what I do is I talk about the book. I give you your, the top three points that you get from, um, you know, the book if you if you if you choose to read it. But if you don't want to read it, you can just listen to my three points and and get yourself going. And um, I got to tell you, I I, I really think uh, people that want to learn from books should come and listen to these because, you know. Um, I'm a guy who's read 4,000 books, so I, I, that's a level of longevity that should hopefully give you some confidence that I, I can extract good things from a book that will be useful for you. Yeah, and I'm trying to figure out how old you are and how many books you would have read a year because I'm, go- <laughs> I'm, I'm going, Mike, you're 15 at this year. <laughs> I'm 55, and I've been an avid reader since I was nine years old. Wow. Okay, so that's 25. Give it 25 years, 26 years, 4,000 books. Do the math, people. That's a hell of a big read I, I, actually, each year. It's, it's 46 years. Oh. It's it's 46 years, from 9 till 55, 46 oh, years. Oh, from 9. Reading. I thought you said 19. Sorry, I thought you said 19. Uh, Sorry. Uh, no, no, okay, no worries. Well, math was never my forte. Um <laughs> That's okay. That's cool. It gets me by. Well, that's a Brucey bonus. Thank you for that. That was awesome. Um, No, great. Well, look, I wish you the best of luck with this course that you're thinking of doing. And, um, yeah, let's hope that people get in touch with you. God bless your heart, Claire. Thanks for having me on. You're an amazing host. You ask amazing questions. You got things out of me that I've never said to anybody else on any other show before. So good on you. Oh, wow. Okay. Happy days. Anyone out there in media world listening, right? Listen to Nikki. It's all good. (laughs) No, that's cool. Look, thank you, Nikki. Brilliant. All right. Well, I'll say bye for now then. Keep in touch. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast and you would like to hear more, please hit subscribe wherever you like to hear podcasts. If you would like to support us further, share this episode with your friends and family. And finally, drop us a review on iTunes as I'd love to hear your thoughts, comments and ideas. It all helps me to understand and produce awesome content you want to hear just like this. If you want to check out our past episodes, write to us, appear on the podcast or for links, resources and show notes, go to our website www.strongsingleandhuman.com We are also on all the usual social media platforms Insta, Facey and Twitter I hope you have a wonderful week and I hope to see you back here again soon Be kind to yourself and remember no one is perfect we're all just putting one foot in front of the other and doing our best I'm Claire Martin, and you've been listening to the Strong, Single and Human podcast.